All right, welcome everybody to our meeting this 1st of May, 2023. So um, we have, let me just see. Um, we have Melissa Fowler here, who is essentially a new member of the partnership and we have Spencer Bates here, who is sort of tuning in with us and potentially applying. I wonder if I could just have you each take a minute to introduce yourselves and um, remember to unmute. Uh, Melissa, why don't we start with you? And then, then we'll continue from there. And once that happens, we'll introduce ourselves too. Okay. Well, hi everyone. Um, so I am on the planning board. I'm a member on the planning board. Um, I've also um, been in construction for about 35 years. Um, everything from um, residential um, to theme to commercial to industrial. I've kind of been all over, mostly in uh, project managing, um, you know, the project management side of things. I don't, I, you wouldn't hire me to actually do anything for you. That would not be a good idea if it's not done with a computer. Um, so I'm um, George, our chair and the planning board asked me to step in and sort of lend an ear and help out where I can. So I'm happy to be of assistance. Thanks so much, Melissa. It's great to have you here. And Spencer, you are tuning into us. Can you please introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Spencer Daisy Bates. We uh, we did the Hippie Valley thing, so it's actually hyphenated. Um, I, I live in town, I work in town, and uh, I'm just looking to uh, get involved to help out. I'm not, I don't have anything to do with construction. Uh, I'm just a, I'm a, an attorney in town. I don't really even do all that much real estate, but I figured I'd volunteer to see what I could do to help. Okay, and it sounds like you have an application in, right, Spencer? But I do, you, yes. Yeah, you haven't been officially appointed to the um, housing partnership yet. No, no, I put in my application and then it was, well, why don't you come to the meetings and see if it's something you wanna do and say hi to everybody. Okay, sounds good. So um, let's go around and introduce ourselves so that both of you know us. Um, my name is Carmen Juno. I'm the chair, current chair of the Housing Partnership. I've been on the partnership for four years. I came to it with a background of working with homeless veterans um, out of the VA. Um, I'm, and I'm also a homeowner in Florence. Richard? Yes, my name is Richard Abusa. I'm a Florence resident. I've been on the partnership since its inception, I think 30 some years ago. Uh, I'm a local property manager and uh, I also serve on a town board that's the redevelopment authority. Thanks, Richard. Edgardo. Hi, my name is Edgardo Cancel. Um, I also go by Edgar, um, and I, I've been a member of the partnership for about three, uh, four years, uh, maybe a little longer. And um, I'm a, a renter in Florence um, and a former uh, housing, uh, public housing resident in Northampton. And I'm also on the board of the Northampton Housing Authority. Thanks, Edgar. Bev. Uh, hi. Um, I don't think uh, Spencer and I are related at all, um, but who knows? We check ancestry. Um, I uh, am retired, which means that I'm busier than ever. Uh, but for about 40 years, I um, was involved in a variety of um, organizations doing affordable housing development. Most recently, and for 35 years, I headed the real estate group at the Community Builders. You may know us. Um, and now, in addition to spending time uh, volunteering, um, 
with this board. I'm also on the uh, CPC board. Um, and as everyone else here has said, uh, for me, the, the prime motivation is to see if I can add value, uh, maybe share a little bit of what I've learned over the years um, to the effort to, to, to create more and better affordable housing in Northampton. I have also observed as we're talking that apparently you have to live in Florence in order to be on this board. Uh, <laughs> I am a homeowner in, in Florence as well. Nice to meet you. Thank you, Bev. Keith? Hi, Keith Benoit. I'm the Community Development Planner with the City, so I staff this board along with the Disability Commission, uh, and I mostly deal with Community Development Block Grant, which does have a housing component, and I'm also the ADA Coordinator, which deals with um, uh, Merits with Disability Act and housing uh, discrimination if it, if it comes up. All right, thanks, Gordon. So I do not live in Florence. I am a homeowner in Leeds um, and I have, I'm the vice chair of the housing partnership. I think I've been a member since 2009. Um, and I am an attorney. Uh, I work at Community Legal Aid. Uh, most of my work though was in Springfield. We specialize in eviction defense. Thank you. Gwen, I left you till the end and you have a couple of minutes here. Go ahead. Okay, great. Hi, my name is Gwen. And um, I, I've actually, this is my first meeting back tonight. Um, I initially um, was planning on resigning. I have a lot going on. Um, and so, but then last month I watched the meeting and I really missed it. So, um, <laughs> so I came back. Um, so I've been here about a year, I think. Um, and I am, I've been a single mom um, for 35 years. I've also worked in construction as a tile contractor um and got injured and burnt out um and then uh i ended up uh in northampton um after that accident i ended up in the city of northampton um in public housing and so i kind of come from that angle um and i'm a full-time student right now and my studies uh, are focused on um environmental justice, um, international and ethnic studies, indigenous studies, Native American indigenous studies and policy. And so, yeah, I think I said sustainability. So thanks. All right, so good to have you back. Thank you. Thanks for thanks, having me Gwen. back. <laughs> thanks, Gwen. All right, introductions done. Let's go on to the first agenda item, which is approval of the minutes from April 3rd. Does anybody have any corrections, first of all? I move we approve the minutes as submitted. I'll second. Okay, well, so let's go around. Um, Richard, you're obviously a yes. Yes. Gordon, you're obviously a yes. Bev? Yes. Edgar? Yes. Um, Gwen, you weren't here, but you could, I was reading up about minutes today and you could still approve the minutes assuming that you read them. All right, I will abstain. Okay. I say yes. Minutes have been approved, right? Okay. Um, I just wanted to make a brief announcement about the um, officers for next year. So I'm the chair, Gordon's the vice chair. Um, Gordon's been in and out of chair and vice chair for many years. Um, we're sort of thinking about how we wanna organize next year. But once again, if you have any interest in being chair or vice chair, let one of us know and we will continue our thinking with that input in mind. All right, cool. Um, does the Municipal Affording Housing Trust Fund have an update? And if you do, because we have Spencer and Melissa here, um, could you give a brief 
summary of what that is so that we have everybody on board. Sure, so we created a little um, presentation if, if I can present that, is that okay? Sure. Yes. Okay, great. Um, I am going to have to share my screen. Mm -hmm. I just made you co-host, so you should be able to share a screen. Okay, let me just bring it up. Bear with me. Um, uh oh, geez, I got to exit the full screen first to get back. Um, Okay, so actually, okay, so um, the update is here. We've been um, talking for quite a little while now about reviving the Northampton Affordable Trust Housing Trust Fund. And um, this is just a small study, which of course is never all that small. It could always get deeper and deeper, so. Um, so the Northampton Affordable Housing Trust Fund is currently inactive, um, but it does exist and we really want to revive it. Um, for, uh, we think that it could bring more economic stability uh, to the community and for social equity and for a community where people live where they work. Um, and also to keep the commitment um, to affordable housing as a priority. So the history of the um, Affordable Housing Trust right now um, is kind of a little bit shrouded and in, 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 in a little bit mysterious, but we did find some stuff and then I had an update today at the end of the day, so I can fill you in on that. But um, so it appears to have been started in Northampton in 2002 and it was funded one, it funded one project only for uh, um, affordable housing um, vouchers for people who were moving um, in during, um, uh the ship from hampton gardens i think to hathaway farms that's what we've gathered and um so um another little bit of feedback on that that we did get from peg um keller is that really the trust fund was created while people made transition to low uh, who were low income and they were going from um hathaway farms was shifting from low income to affordable or something like that. So they created these, uh, this fund for that. So um, we, we believe that the AHTF is an essential resource actually, and um, we can discuss this. Um, so I will just review really quickly. There's some bullet points here. So what is it? Why is it important? The timeline and that and the other thing. So the Affordable Housing Trust Fund is a fund established by a local government for the production of and preservation of affordable housing. It increases supply of affordable housing in a community, particularly for low and moderate income households. It can create new affordable housing or rehabilitate existing housing. And it promotes economic development, economic stability and social equity. And by providing affordable housing options, Funds can attract and retain a diverse range of workers and businesses um, that contribute to the economic vitality of the city. So a timeline of uh, the Massachusetts Affordable Housing Trust is, um, it was established in 2002, um, but there are um, different affordable housing trust funds across Massachusetts that started during the 1980s and maybe even the late 70s. Um, and so they were it was designed to provide resources to create and preserve affordable housing throughout the state um, for households whose income are not more than 110% of the median income. And initially it was funded with $20 million for the first three years of its existence. So cities and towns that wanted to do this, um, you know, they had a starting fund that they could get, uh, get money from to initiate it. And um, so, uh, eligible um, applicants who can use the housing trust fund are government subdivisions, community development corporations, local housing authorities, community action agencies, like such as Safe Passage, um, uh, 
community-based or neighborhood-based nonprofit housing organizations, nonprofit organizations, for-profit entities, and also private employers actually too. So since the 1970s, housing trust funds became used increasingly through the 1980s and 90s. And uh, as of January, 2023, that was when I started doing this slide show, we discovered that 73% of Massachusetts communities do in fact have a housing fund in addition to the CPA and they work in tandem together. They work in tandem. Um, so um, there's just some resources and details that I included in the slideshow. We concluded, we included all of our sources here where this information comes from. So I can um, forward it to anybody who's interested in looking at it and looking at some of the sources if they're interested. Um, so some examples of affordable housing trust funds in Massachusetts, there are many. Um, so we'll just talk about Boston, which started in 1986. Um, in 24 years, the Neighborhood Housing Trust has committed more than $222 million in linkage funds. Um, these funds have supported the creation or preservation of 14,116 income restricted housing units throughout the city of Boston. And the projects funded or completed in 2020 range in scope from the reservation and income restriction of five unit row house in the South End to the acquisition and income restriction of the 207 unit Morton Village Apartments in Mattapan. Um, also in West Newbury, Massachusetts, which was, they just started. So I think what we're looking at and what we're seeing here is that there are many communities that have started new housing trust funds in the last two years because there's such a press for housing in Massachusetts. So the West New Newbury Affordable Housing Trust Fund was founded in the fall of 2021 and has recently begun working on their first three-year action plan. And they are also in Amherst, Arlington, Cambridge, Great Barrington, Newton, Salem, Somerville, Worcester, and more. Um, so here are some examples of projects funded by these. Um, so in Boston in 2020, Boston provided over $13.5 million in funding uh, to the creation of new affordable housing units in the city, as well as the preservation of existing units. Um, Oh, I think we already, I already sort of did this. Um, and in Cambridge, um, it supports the, oh, right. And then um, Cambridge. So in Cambridge, the CAHTF um, provided 4.6 million in funding to begin the 20, 2072 Mass Ave affordable housing development, which will include 49 units with a ground level that supports neighborhood retail space, which I think is really cool. And these funds, they play a critical role in supporting the development of new affordable um, housing units um, and the preservation of existing units during a time of increased need, as well as like with the Cambridge idea, you know, opening things up for people economically. Um, so um, they're usually, how are they supported? Where does the funding come from? So. Um, we looked at that. And so um, the most common funding resources are like CPA funds, fees on new development, um, government grants and donations, um, and then other established and possible funding sources could be community benefit agreements. Um, so these are legally binding agreements between the developers and the community organizations. And it's intended to ensure that development projects provide tangible benefits to the community, which I think is really great. Um, some CBAs include provisions that require developers to contribute to affordable housing trust funds as a condition of approval for their projects. So if a high end came in, then you know we could get that kind of a commitment and have the money coming in. Um, Airbnb taxes, um, real estate transfer fees, and tax on empty, um, if, so if, if we could tax empty downtown properties, which would be probably helpful in Northampton right about now with agreements that go to the um, AHPF fund. So the, the um, so, oh, I can't see the top part of it, but anyway, the title, but we'll talk about the CPA. Um, the Community Preservation Act is a state law and it allows for cities and towns to establish a dedicated fund for the acquisition, creation, and preservation of open space, historic resources, and affordable housing. Um, 
They're funded by a surcharge on local property taxes and funds can be used for a range of purposes, including affordable housing projects. However, the CPA requires that a portion of the funds be allocated to open space and historic preservation projects. Um, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund is typically established by the local government to fund the development and preservation of affordable housing within a specific geographic area specifically. So the funds are usually derived from a combination of sources, public and private. Funds are usually exclusively to create and um, preserve access to affordable housing. And both the HTF and CBA can be used to support affordable housing, but are not redundant. They're not redundant. Um, that was one thing that Peg had said was that most people were saying it is redundant, but it's it's not redundant. Um, and so what's the greatest challenge? We have talked about this before. Um, one of the greatest challenges is funding, always funding, securing the funding for affordable housing, publicly or privately can be difficult. Building costs are higher right now than ever, so that can be challenging. Um, and But there's no shortage of need. There's just only a shortage of housing. So we see that time and time again. I look at the Northampton Facebook page. People are like begging and, you know, um, recent college grads wanna stay nearby near their family and they can't. So I'm seeing stuff like that too. Um, it's political, you know, the attitude in Northampton is generally supportive and embracing of affordable housing, but there's still pushback. Um, sometimes as it, it feels or appears that there's reticence to fund new projects um, and governance. And so once established, the housing trust fund must be managed to ensure that the funds are used effectively and in compliance with regulations. And this can be challenging for a smaller city like Northampton that may have limited staffing um, and potential staffing resources and potential staff may be at capacity. So that's that, um, but we believe that it's worth it. There's still an unmet need in our city for affordable housing. Um, and so the revival of it could provide gap funding for affordable housing needs. It could be a reliable um, funding source, not bound to annual fun funding cycles. It would serve as a housing emergency fund as it did in Boston and elsewhere during the pandemic. And it would fund projects at all different scales um, from new housing to a wheelchair ramp to something you know, small like a lawn cleanup or something like that. So um, from the Amherst um, AHTF, the trust's mission as an instrument of town government is to promote the town's affordable housing priorities as determined through the most recent town housing plan, particularly to create safe, decent and affordable housing to our most vulnerable populations. And we believe this is a great mission to promote affordable housing and it is a priority. So, um, you know, we have here next steps, you know, identify the need, <laughs> done, um, develop a plan, um, a plan for reactivating it, um, draft some bylaws um, and governing documents, identify the funding, outline the roles and responsibilities. Maybe we could have a subcommittee for that. Um, establish a legal structure. So work with the city legal department or outside counsel to establish the legal structure. For example, it's, yeah, for example, nonprofit corporation, a public entity, or establishing AHTF as a department with, within or under the umbrella of an existing agency, um, secure funding from private developers, grants, state or federal agencies, or allocating public funds from the city budget, um, appoint a board of trustees, elected officials or community members with expertise in affordable housing development, finance or policy would be good people to be on the board of trustees, hire staff, um, depending on the scale of the fund. Um, it may involve hiring an executive director or pro program manager as well as support staff as needed. Um, implement policies and procedures. So processes for allocating funds, reviewing and approving applications for affordable housing projects and staying in compliance with all applicable regulations and requirements. Um, and so we actually added some additional resources if anybody's interested through 
um, uh, you know, different points. There's a link to Mass Housing Affordable Housing Trust information. Um, there's also the Boston Neighborhood Trust 2020 report, which anyone can take a look at. Um, there's also the mass.gov site, which tells about the Affordable Housing Trust. Um, and there's the Mass Housing um, 2018 guidebook, and then a housing toolbox, and a housing trust fund link here, a housing trust fund project. So that is it. Thank you so much for your patience and interest. And thank you to my subcommittee members. We had um, a great time working on this project together. Thank you. Gwen, thank you so much for that, for that presentation. That is really great to have those visuals while somebody's explaining this. And Edgar, and I know Hannah, Hannah's going to try to tune in at, at 6.15. She, she wasn't able to make it on time tonight. Thank you so much. So I want to um, entertain questions and comments from people. Richard. Um, yes, if the, the partnership wants to go into it, it is not really the origins of our trust fund are not shrouded in mystery. And in fact, the origins of the trust fund very much parallel uh, the origins of this board and how it came into place. And it's probably uh, an instructive thing for us to be aware of as we um, uh, contemplate this. And I'd be happy to speak very briefly about it at some point if anybody wants. I, I was there, but there were a lot of people in town who were there. Could you do that right now, Richard? Sure. So essentially, uh, if you go back in time in the 70s, there was a housing crisis. And one of the responses to the crisis was the government helped fund what are, were later called expiring use properties. They were affordable housing properties that were funded with government funding. And a condition of the funding was they had to remain affordable, I think, in most circumstances for 25 years. And at that point in time, I think we've all learned a lesson 25 years ago in 1970 seemed like that'll be forever. The problem will be solved. You know, that's a perfectly good way to do it. And, you know, one of the things that we have struggled with in the entire term of the partnership is making sure that we get the longest term uh, affordability uh, guarantees in all the structures that we create. So there was a lesson there. And what happened is all over the country, there was a massive problem where these expiring use properties, the developers who played by the rules had the opportunity to go market rate. And there was a huge loss of affordable housing. And in Northampton, uh, to our credit, there was a uh, several expiring use properties, St. Michael's Church, which now is affordable. There's a whole list of them. And the town proactively, the planning department stepped in and said, we want to try and creatively address this. The state and federal government had funds, but the developers were not under a particular obligation to do anything. They could do whatever they wanted. But uh, you know, uh, there's a bully pulpit, and uh, Mayor Ford at that time was um, actually, I think Mayor Ford was city councilor at that time. But um, the town got together and decided they wanted to preserve all of them in Hathaway Farms or, or Hampton, uh, what was it called before Hampton Manor? Um, Hampton Gardens. Hampton Gardens, thank Hampton you. Hampton Gardens, yeah. 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 Um, was a big one. It was a huge chunk of our affordable housing. And we worked with the developer. Uh, it was Spear Development. And um, they had some responsiveness. And they came up with a plan where they could go market rate, but at a with some guarantees of affordability, and that they would take some of the profit from the sale to um, fund a trust fund, which is how we got a trust fund, 
But the other piece that's just as salient is that there it was a very contentious uh, issue in town because it balanced property rights of the owners versus the town's desire for affordable housing. And the community came together. They formed what was called a housing action committee, which I was on, which was the precursor to this. And uh, there were city councilors and the mayor and housing uh, for-profit people on it. And they decided they wanted to work together and they saved this and they decided that they wanted to continue working on affordable housing uh, issues and went before the city council and formed the housing partnership. And there weren't that many housing partnerships. And over the years, I think historically Northampton has been lauded as having one of the most active and uh, constructive housing partnerships. So our origins actually parallel that of the housing partners of the housing trust fund, which is very good reason to not abandon it just because it seems uh, inconvenient at this moment. And there's lots of things in the future where it might be handy. And and I, I'm certainly been, you know, as somebody who's seen it over the period of time, a strong advocate of, of reviving it. So if there's Thanks, other Richard. questions, I probably probably can dredge up those memories. Thank you so much for that whole history. You were one email away, so thank you. <laughs> Other thoughts, questions, and then my my question to all of you and the Housing Trust um, subcommittee is, where do we go from here? And I want to add one one other piece of information, especially for Spencer. I know you're watching and. Melissa, I'm sort of assuming you know this, but maybe not, that the um, Community Preservation Act has money for affordable housing, but they have a twice a year cycle. And in a municipal affordable, uh, uh, the Affordable Housing Trust Fund um, would give our community, as in Amherst and other communities like when, like when delineated, the opportunity to be way more nimble and we have received sort of pushback from the city, including Wayne Fiden before he retired, the mayor, and in some ways, Carolyn Nish too, around, you know, no, we don't need that because we have the CPA. Um, Carolyn Nish added at one point, um, if the affordable housing trust fund was really earmarked for workforce housing rather than affordable housing, that would be looked upon more favorably. We've gone on to explore this despite the city's pushback. Um, so that that's just an FYI, Spencer, for you and Melissa, you know, for you as well. But other other thoughts, questions, and my question is, where do we go from here? Dev. Yeah, um, my hand, um, my digital hand wave isn't working for some reason. And also, I wanted to introduce my new puppy, Luna. Uh, wow. She, the reason I've been bouncing around the room so much, uh, for some reason, I had child care responsibility tonight. Um, but yeah, um, when I was so impressed with the presentation, first of all, thanks so much. Um, yeah. I presume you can get a copy somewhere, um, mm -hmm. but let's make sure we all know. Um, but I was gonna say pretty much what you were saying. Um, I felt very discouraged after that brief meeting we had with the mayor um, and Carolyn. Um, and I don't think that the perception that there is not a need for these funds can't be countered, but I think we have to do more than check the box saying that uh, evidence of need has been demonstrated. And one of the conversations that we had as a group, I don't think it's gone very far, is to set out to try and understand, or at least to, you know, create a scorecard in relative terms for the reasons that more housing isn't produced in Northampton. Is it lack of land? Is it NIMBY? Is it um, not enough developers interested in working in Northampton? Mm -hmm. Is it um, lack of funds or something we haven't even thought of? Um, and I suspect 
that it's a complex uh, uh, array of all of those. Um, that doesn't mean that money shouldn't be part of the uh, conversation if in fact enough people think we got to break through uh, that wall. Um, I should know this, but I don't recall, Gwen, um, what is the uh, maximum income uh, that someone who lives in housing supported by affordable housing trust funds? Is it 80% of median? Um, I believe um, that this, the AHTF, and it may have changed. I know at least initially it was 110% um, or less. Yeah. So, you know, to your point, when you talk about workforce housing, that is workforce housing. That's what it is. Yeah. And yeah. smart developments, in my opinion, today don't define themselves as serving one group affordable. Some of the older developments are regulated such that they have to meet uh, deep affordability guidelines. But um, part of the case, I think, is that this funding is flexible in terms of being able to create mixed income communities. Uh, I'm, I'm rambling. I'm all in support, obviously, but I do think we have to get past this question of um, need. Uh, seems everybody in this room is pretty much in agreement, but there are some other people to convince, I, I suspect. So I think that, um, you know, we're having this community meeting on June 13th, which everybody will be invited to get an official invitation. Um, which is, which is gonna be chaired by the MEE Light Committee of CHAPA, the state housing um, uh, kind of like information and, and support for communities, um, people. And I think it's gonna be really interesting. One of the things it's gonna do is it, it's gonna expand the conversation beyond the housing partnership and a few other people um, to what, um, other ideas and what other kinds of um, um, implementations can we see. So I just wanted to add that. We don't actually have that on the agenda tonight. We're going to meet with the housing partnership again before that. That's on June 13th. But I'm really looking forward to that conversation as an expansion of, um, yeah, how can we go beyond this conversation? Anyway, other comments, thoughts? Um, Spencer. Yeah, thanks. My only question is just a random person who showed up today is, um, is the main difference from what I'm getting from Gwen's excellent presentation um, between the CPA and the trust fund is the agility of the trust fund to sort of address housing needs on a more flexible basis? Because if so, I think that's probably one of the main, you know, counter arguments that you would need to make in that this, you know, the, the CPA does one very, you know, does one thing and that a trust fund would need to do something else, right? But just. That was yes, if I can just respond to that. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, so with the affordable housing trust fund, there is some federal funding that communities get that can only be placed into an, an affordable housing trust fund. So I think that's one really important thing. Um, and then the other thing is that the affordable housing trust fund can actually earn interest. So I just wanted to put that out there. Thanks, Gwen. Other comments, Beth? I think Gordon had his hand up. Yes, Gordon, yes, I realize that. Gordon, go ahead. <laughs> Did you want to say something? No, no, go ahead. Yeah, so I, I put it. I put in the chat some information about what Springfield just did. I was actually pleasantly surprised to hear from a colleague of mine, an organizer uh, colleague who organizes in Springfield, um, that they just actually created an affordable housing trust fund in Springfield. And it was, it was a three-year battle. Um, and I, you know, and it was interesting to see what they what they're actually going to use it for because it's broader than just what we continually to think about it as just new development of new construction, but they're actually using it to help with their blight problem, so to help bring properties back into the market that would have been otherwise abandoned um, or or not available, um, and, and making and making um, 
grants to low and moderate income homeowners that need help keeping their properties in compliance so they don't lose them to like a, a receiver or the city. Um, but but the key but the key to their the key to their success was they need they had a champion within city council. So it seems like if we are really serious about trying to move this forward, we need a champion in Northampton City Council who's gonna take this on and be a leader for us because ultimately it's gonna to have to require involvement of the city council and the mayor. I think we can find those people. Thanks, Gordon. I Richard? think so too, but it wasn't the, it's not oh. gonna be the mayor. Yeah, no, <laughs> it's, it's not. not initially. Maybe it was yeah. to bring her around. Yeah, I think one other difference if I understand things correctly is the CPA is essentially, you know, tripartite in its focus where uh, open space and um, historic preservation. And traditionally in Northampton, uh, open space is the sort of crowd pleaser. And uh, an affordable housing trust fund is solely focused around housing issues. And I agree with what Gordon said. It can be broadly defined because we have a broad range of issues but it means that those funds really have no other competitor. Whereas I believe, despite what the city may say, that there is competition and that housing doesn't necessarily get, uh, it gets a lot in the city, the city is enlightened, but it doesn't get as much as it needs in my book. And Rich, Richard, when you, you gave the history, but wasn't the actual use, the initial use, the expiring use was basically to create a mini section, kind of a subsidized yes, program. Absolutely. It was they used to subsidize the subsidized. tenants of pathways who were being raised to market rent. Right. Yeah. And, and that is, you know, at this moment in time, paying money to tenants sort of might not have the political traction, you know, but that was the solution. And the mayor and the city councilors were behind it. You know, it was the way that the best way that they could preserve it. So. Okay, and so I, I know two people. Two people want to speak. Bev, and then no, I think Keith. Keith was uh, before me. Keith, go ahead. Uh, you're muted. Yeah. Uh, just to <laughs> piggyback on what uh, Gordon said, so Springfield's um, they have a lot of blighted properties, up to fifty a year, go through receivership, and that is they've been criticized for. Um, whether real or perceived, um, it, a lot of those houses um, end up going from the current owner to the the person doomed to rehab, who the receiver. So it's basically taking property from someone who might be low income, person of color, um, things like that. And be, through the receivership program, um, it gets changed, you know, basically um, to the person doing the fixing. So um, in all costs, uh, receivership um, is not the best option, um, but hopefully we, we haven't had receivership here, uh, at least that I've been here, um, but it would be a good, um, and we do have a housing rehab uh, right now. Uh, we, we've increased the a level, so we're only doing about two or three houses a year, um, but we've run into a lot of bigger problems as like, a new roof and failed septic, um, but that would help. Yeah. Thanks, Keith. Bev? Yeah, I just um, want, wanted to observe about the agility issue relative to uh, CPC. Um, they define how they uh, fund and don't feel that they are missing opportunities or underserving projects because they only meet twice a year. I've heard this group talk about that a lot but it's not their perception that that's a problem. Um, whoever uh, pointed out that there are three uh, funding um, eligibility groups is, is right. I have not seen what I would consider to be a worthy housing project not get funded in the two rounds that I've participated in. Um, could the ones that got funded uh, benefit from more money than they received? Is there sort of a, you know, we do three, four hundred thousand dollars a project, that's what we do kind of mentality? I think that's absolutely true. Um, and I, I have to say, this may not sound very politic, but um, uh, the, the big money is going into conservation, whoever said that, absolutely. And a lot of money is going into 
uh, preservation of the historic properties um, that, and we've talked about this as a group, so I, I don't think I'm speaking out of school. People wonder whether the problem is not the fact that the buildings need help. It's the fact that the owners of the buildings haven't been able to be very good uh, sponsors of those buildings and probably won't be in the future. So should we continue to dump money into, you know, exterior repairs when the problems, in one case, you know, we're funding bathroom uh, uh, replacements. Um, so in any event, there's a lot there to unpack. And I think it would be really unfortunate to in any way pit this idea against CPC. They could be wonderfully uh, compatible. Um, mm -hmm. You know, one of the big challenges for totally. non developers is getting pre-development money to get your project going. And again, as I understand it, there's no reason why pre-development loans couldn't be part of what the Affordable Housing Trust does, just as an example. I, I, I wouldn't see any reason to, um, you know, pit one the, the right. trust. I know you don't. Yeah. Yes, um, but but and and yet they can work in tandem together. You know, so um, you know this would give. In fact, this would give the, the CPC more flexibility in the case of, for example, you know, um, you know, helping with a, a bathroom as opposed to an exterior face of a, a historical building or something like that. Um, the other thing that I think is so, so important is that we have the type of housing that helps our city to become more diverse, that helps yes. our city to be a place where people want to come because we yeah. are Northampton. We're the city of Northampton. We have colleges here. We have people graduating from college. We're losing all this great talent. It's, it's, it's seeping out. And Massachusetts itself has had a lot of people move out of Massachusetts. And I think that Northampton would be such a better city if we could just sort of deal with that. And I, I know about the great amount of money, which I have thought about, Bev, being invested in conservation. I think you mean conservation of land, right? Correct. Yep. Yes. And so, and that's fine, you know, in all the talk Absolutely. about infill. But I personally, like as a designer, like as somebody that comes from a constructive background, multicultural person, I would love to see sustainability include ecology somehow. I would I would love to see a, a, a better melding of that and an improvement in that department. So um, that's probably something with the climate committee, but thanks. Okay, so I want to move the conversation forward. Does anybody else have a burning comment right this moment? Okay, my cat does, but he's not part of the um, committee. I think first of all, you've done an amazing job. That was a great presentation. And I wanna acknowledge that Hannah's here. Hi, Hannah. And the presentation that Gwen did, the PowerPoint that you all put together was really, really, um, really positive, excellent. So the question always is, what is the next step? We on the Housing Partnership feel like this would be a complement to, to the community preservation funds. Um, I think personally that this meeting we're going to have on June 13th, maybe I'm, maybe I'm putting too much stock in it, but I think that it will open up the conversation so that we can um, uh, be engaged and engage others in how, if we had another set of funds like the Municipal Housing Trust Fund, we could further housing efforts here. Um, what do other people think about next steps? I'm thinking we should take a vote on it, but we can't because it's not on the agenda today. But I mean, maybe, I mean, we have done a lot of speaking with people, but maybe it's time for us as the partnership to sort of take a vote on this, get it so that it's voted on and then bring it to city council. I'm not sure what the process would be. That's a, that's a very good point. Can anybody else, Keith or Gordon or anybody or Bev, can you say something about that? I can't say anything about that, but I do think the funding issue has to get fleshed out a bit. Uh, we talked about uh, some kind of uh, transfer tax as the vehicle 
uh, not the only vehicle, but the one that we were going to mm. initially pursue. And that will be enormously controversial, as you know, uh, better than I perhaps. Um, and so maybe it would help to do a little modeling of what this might look like in terms of scale. Um, and I, I did put my hand up last time you were looking for new members for the committee, and I'd be very happy to help if 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 you want any help. Um, but one of the things to do would be to think about how to have a worthwhile program that has X amount of dollars and maybe could just focus on some smaller scale things uh, as you you build the capital base uh, and certainly as you fight the good fight for um, uh, transfer tax or anything of similar consequence. Um, so that's the first question people are going to ask, right? Where's the money going to come from? I think that would be an amazing way for you to further this committee with that knowledge. Other comments and thoughts? Looks like Edgar has his hand up. Who? Edgar. 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 Go ahead. Yeah, like you're halfway cut off. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, sorry. Uh, no, yeah, no, I was just thinking that um, um, maybe we should uh, start looking for our champion in city council. Mm -hmm. I think one other thing that we need to do is to get a better handle on what and how additional funds might be used. I think we we listened to Laura Baker and uh, it was hard for me to know whether or not we should read between the lines because uh, people who are in the afford, we have a very limited you know, universe of people who are the producers and they have to maintain their relationships with the various parties that are their uh, operative partners in the city. And I don't think it was a would have been a politic thing for Laura to say, you know what, we're not getting enough. We need more. Uh, so I don't know how the best way is to document that there really are opportunities that are being missed. But I think until we get some sort of handle on a way to do that, we don't really have a viable way to go to the to city councilors. And even if we have people who are inclined to us, we need to give them the tools and ammunition so that they can convince their colleagues. So I don't think that we a resolution from us is meaningful at this point. I think there's been a lot of positive sentiment on the housing partnership. What we if we're going to vote on a resolution, it should be perhaps more of a uh, proposal or an outline or a, you know, some sort of um, more formed um, presentation about what this would accomplish for Northampton specifically. And I think that what Bev was just offering was, it seems to me, exactly that a kind of a modeling of what this could be. And I think that that's the, to me, I think that's the appropriate next step before we engage city councilors or take a vote is to model and to say, this could be. Other comments? Jenna? Keith, did you have your hand up? No. Gwen? Oh, I thought Hannah had had had. had, oh, had. Hannah, Hannah, go ahead. Thank you. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think that I was, that was a, a floating question for me was that I think that we're kind of moving from the abstract phase to like the, how do we do this? And I think some yeah. of those questions were answered. Uh, and Bev, it would be so good to have you um, and your experience. So, I mean, it, my understanding is it seems like the next step for the subcommittee is to you know, maybe consult a lot of the documentation that already exists for other affordable housing trust funds across mass. There's a really good um, guidebook that I also included at the end of the um, uh, Google 
slide presentation that's like a, a guidebook for how to establish housing trust funds. So it seems like what people are looking for before we go to the city council is just like something really uh, hard to argue with, like that it's out of the zone of dreams. And like, here are some of the projects that we might be looking to yeah. fund. Here are some of the things. So is that is that correct? Yeah, something very concrete, right? Cool. Richard? Yeah, one more thing that I think we should remember and and keep that's an enormous asset. We are not creating an affordable housing trust fund. We already have one. It's documented. It's there. The city should be ashamed of itself for having a dedicated need um, institution and letting it go moribund. So we don't need to play that yeah. card now, but it's not like, you know, I don't even, you know, we need to get that document and see what the structure is. But, you know, it may be that the first step is to say, you've got this board, you haven't filled the, the posts. The first step is to fill the posts and let them make a presentation to city council. But the board exists. And that's, that's a huge mm -hmm. uh, thing in our favor. Other, other thoughts? Bev? Yeah, Carmen, you keep saying this, but I think that's um, fortuitous that uh, the, the, the meeting's happening on the 13th. Uh, and I wonder if we should be um, clear that some of us are going to want to talk about this at that meeting and that that's a good venue in which to start to air some of these other topics. And I predict that there will be a lot of um, perhaps subtle but support from the CHAPA folks to to explore this. Mm -hmm. So I don't know who's planning to go, but I just, you know, to the extent that all of us are in general agreement, we wanna we wanna start to sort this. Let's say it. Um, one thing I was thinking about, thank you, Bev. Um also was, you know, looking at looking at how affordable housing trust funds work they are usually working in tandem with community development corporations. You know, they are, they have that flexibility, um, you know, so there was that. And then I, I forget the other thing I was gonna say, but. Um, so so um, I think that Bev, I mean, I think if you could meet with the, Affordable Housing Trust Fund subcommittee this coming month, right? Edgar and Hannah and Gwen, when you meet and start to hammer out some concrete vision, um, I think that would be really helpful. We have our next housing partnership meeting on June, I think it's June 5th. That's a week before this MEI light meeting. We could hear from you further about what some of that concrete vision is. And then those of you who come to the, or those of us who come to the meeting, I, I think we'll have a number of opportunities to talk about this. I don't know exactly how the meeting is going to go, never been a part of it. I am not, I am not facilitating it, but it will be a huge opportunity to enlarge a conversation, including with some information like that. Does that sound like good, Bev, that you could join the um, subcommittee this next month and then report? It, absolutely. If you have a meeting date set, just let me know what it is. I'll do my best. Okay, great. All right. Thank you so much to that subcommittee. I'm I'm so I'm so grateful for all the work you've done. And again, that presentation was really excellent. Okay. Something a little less exciting, um, discuss the small area FMR. Keith, do you have an update? And could you also just explain in a couple sentences for Melissa and Spencer what the FMR is? Yes, so um, FMR stands for fair market rate uh, rent and or fair market rate. Um, and that is the, um, the rate at which uh, HUD uh, the voucher amount that they give out um, for housing authorities and their mobile vouchers and things like that. So it's set by 
um, area and in Northampton, we are part of the Springfield Metropolitan Statistical Area, MSA. Um, so Northampton being higher rent compared to Springfield or Holyoke or Westfield, um, a lot of people that have vouchers have a hard time um, using their voucher when they get it in Springfield or in Northampton. Um, so when you get a voucher, you only have 30 or 60 days or something to find a house. Um, so once you get the voucher, the clock is on. And if you can't find something, um, then, uh, you know, um, you lose it. Um, and people are on, on the waiting list for a long time. Uh, and we previously, so HUD, um, uh, you can volunteer, the housing authority can volunteer to um, basically use what they call a small area FMR. And um, you can do two things. And so I've been doing research and now I'm going to get more into the update. So um, really I have two options. The housing authority, you can um, basically without HUD's approval, you can just notify them that you're gonna use a um, small area FMR for each zip code, a different one, right? And you can just tell HUD you're doing it, right? But you still have to um, make sure you're not adversely impacting your current voucher holders. Uh, the other thing is you can request HUD for a overall um, FMR across all your different area codes. Um, in Northampton, we only have, I don't know if it's three or four area codes, um, but I did have a conversation with the Boston Housing Authority, um, I forgot his title, um, but he helped kind of, uh, he was there when Boston went to the uh, small area FMR and they they worked in tandem uh, with Cambridge and DHCD to basically notify HUD, hey, we're going to do this. And so each zip code has a different rate. Um, but critically, we heard from the Northampton Housing Authority that if they gave out more money to each person, that they would be able, they would not be able to service as many people. Um, what Boston did is they appealed the FMR when it's published. Um, so in August, they published this FMR, you have three months to make an appeal. And you kind of kind of have you, all your data um, put together before HUD publishes. So you imagine doing a rent study and um, I can send um, my notes and my summary and the um, the guides I was, I was reading. Um, but there's four things you have to check off uh, when you make an appeal when you um, make this appeal that you're not adversely um, affecting your um, your voucher holders. Um, so it's a very complicated process and you know standing from the outside, um, you have to, we would need some data from the housing authority. You know, we would need some um, work from them. Uh, but when we talked to them last, they seemed kind of hesitant. And I think there's um, a capacity there on being able to do the rent study, um, you know, um, getting the data. And you also have to amend the, the housing plan, the annual action plan for the housing authority. Um, but, uh, you know, I did a deep dive in the recent Pioneer Valley um, housing, um, the, the 2021 Pioneer Valley housing uh, study. And in there, they talked about, um, or the Springfield Housing Authority um, uh, director, or, but she said that basically the, um, the rent, the the market rate is basically the voucher rent rate rate, so that 
any change in the rent, the voucher would basically raise the, you know, the rent for everyone um, in the city uh, because there's so many vouchers out there. Um, and to make an appeal, we have to have Springfield on board because one of the, and I, if I'm, there's a lot of detail in here. I mean, I'm trying to explain the complexity of, of what it is, but to make an appeal, the appeal has to be represented by 50% of all the vouchers in the jurisdiction. So I believe that would be the Springfield MSA. So basically 51% or 55% of all the vouchers is just Springfield. If you take to account Westfield, Holyoke, Chicopee, Oh, Amherst and Northampton, that is not 50 percent. So there's some coordination um, if we want to make an appeal. So it's like the other thing that we talked about, which Boston used to they've so they made the appeal, so they're getting more money. And the other thing they do is they basically work with public services. Um, agencies, you know, the food, um, the food, um, you know, survival center, the shelters, things like that. Um, and they basically give them each vouchers. So if you go in for, you know, to get food for the week or something like that, they have the ability to uh, work with you on getting vouchers. So they were to, and I think they help with housing navigator. So that's another component is they housing search is one of the um, things that they identified as this missing portion because um, there is a you know time component of search searching um, for housing um, and access to internet and having someone kind of um, you know walk with you and 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 help you out uh, and there's some a good report by the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston which goes into detail about this and so Keith. Keith, yeah. I'm not I'm not sure how much more detail we need. Let me just pull back for a moment and say I feel like um the FMR situation, fair market rent situation for housing voucher recipients is sort of I'm not sure how much time I mean I think we need updates, but I'm not sure how much detail we need and how much time we're going to be spending on that as a committee. Does anybody else have thoughts on that, Gwen? Um, without adjusting the FMR, people have to move out of Northampton. And that's that's chasing people who are historically marginalized, who might be making a transition out of actually public housing into the next phase of their life. Um, and so that without without doing that, and because you know we can see the evidence of rents that have been risen, um, the cost of rent has skyrocketed even out in Western Massachusetts. Um, if if the need is not presented to DHCD, how how will DHCD ask for more funding from the government for for these things? And so it's like if the need is not presented, then it becomes like this sort of hidden problem. Um, and so that's why I think like, even though I know it's gonna be extra work for people or something like that, I think it's something that needs to be done. I that's agree with you, but I think that Keith, because you're sort of more integrally involved with this, I think, I think the more useful information to report to the housing partnership would be what, what are next steps that we could do, right? So I agree with that. And what are next steps to kind of conserve and have us be able to act in a way that would be useful? So speaking about that, are there are there next steps now, or can we hear from you when there there are, or put it on the agenda for next month? Uh, no, I think I think uh, it's a valid assessment. Um, there's just a lot of coordination and cajoling. Um, I, I did talk to um, uh, some people to try to make some more coordination. Uh, but yeah, I think um, it can be as needed. And, you know, at some point, uh, I can make a presentation, you guys can make a, you know, a formal kind of letter of support or something. Yeah. Um, but we did have a conversation with uh, Housing Authority 
before. So it's not, um, you know, they know that, you know, it's concerned and it's in the fair housing assessment. So it's not. Uh, um, yeah. So I think that, um, first of all, I really appreciate you continuing to pursue this, of course. I think at some point having sort of a little bit of a power presentation like you did when tonight and the housing subcommittee did would be helpful to have a visual. And then, but especially with when when there's an action we can take, you know, what can it be? Can we mobilize around that? You know, can we unify around that? Good, everybody? Gordon? Yeah, just a, a question that kind of will lead to the comment I have as well. I, I, the question I have, Keith, is that you mentioned that there's a, the housing authorities can unilaterally just adopt a, a, a per zip code approach. And it just seems from the point of view of the, the voucher um, holder, um, how that would work because it's it's based upon where you're gonna, isn't it based upon where you actually find the landlord? So you, for example, we could say that, you know, we're going to use a higher payment payment standard for downtown Northampton, and then use a small, you know, uh, less one for Florence. But then it's like, well, I'm searching in both both communities, and it's a, it, depending on where I lease up or I get a landlord willing to rent to me. It's going. It, it might be completely unintelligible to the, from the point of view of the tenant, and it might, you know, expand out into other communities. You get a voucher from Northampton Housing Authority. You don't have to stay in Northampton. You can go to Springfield, New York, Holyoke. Um, so that leads to the comment, which it seems like what you said is a regional approach might be in the best interest of everybody because people do have the flexibility to be able to go anywhere. And this isn't just a Northampton problem. I can tell you that I see it all the time in my work down in Hamden County. People are losing vouchers from Wayfinders, Springfield Housing Authority, Holy Housing Authority, because they can't even find affordable units that fall within the, the, the fair market rent or under the fair market rent and even in those communities. So, and I get that the downside is that, you know, you, the net effect of raising the fair market rent is that it's going to, it means that the housing authority will be paying more out to landlords on behalf of tenants. And that's the cost, the zero sum game that gets played with some of this. And we all, we all understand the need for this. And so then next steps would be, would be good when there, when there are specific ones. So let's finish with this discussion. Did anybody else want to say anything? Uh, can I just respond to uh, Gordon? Yeah. Uh, Gordon, thank you. I, the, um, the question about um, where are the vouchers based off, uh, I, I don't know if you apply Northampton. If, I, I, I need to get back to you on that. But critically, all the housing authorities in our jurisdiction, Springfield, um, Amherst, everything else, they're all above they're all almost pushing 110% of area median. Yeah. Even Springfield is at 108%. Um, so um, they're already trying to, you know, up there, but um, yeah. Okay, thank you. So if I can just say one more thing, yeah. um, just in response to what Gordon just said is, you know, what happens is you wait a long, long time for a voucher and then you finally get the voucher and you look and you put so much work into it and you can't find any place. Mm -hmm. And then you add the discrimination part to it. Um, and um, so then what happens is after 60 days, you just have to stay where you are because you couldn't find a place and your opportunity goes away and you have to go back onto a 20 year waiting list. And so what that ultimately means is it's good. So either way, you're, you're not housing people. So um, I think it's important to work on that. Thank you, Gwen. Okay, so let's, let's move on to other business. Not anticipated that we could put on next month's agenda. One thing I wanna say is the invitation for the MEI light community conversation about housing stock and affordable housing to take place on Ju Tuesday, June 13th. Keith, you're gonna be sending out official invitations within the next week or so, right? Week or 10 days or something like that? Uh, should be Friday or Monday, yes. Okay, and will everybody on the housing partnership will get one of those as well as our whole stakeholders list. And there's also going to be um, 
either a publicity from the mayor's office or we'll send it to city councilors and they'll send it to all their constituents. So we're gonna to try to widely publicize it to make this as open as possible. And we'll be meeting before that on, on June 5th. So that should be interesting. Other new business, unanticipated thoughts of a brief nature. Spencer, do you have any thoughts or questions or? No, it sounds like, thank you for having me today. It's been very- Thank you for forward. attending. And thank you. Uh, I live in Northampton proper for whatever that's worth. Uh, but I, I would, you know, we obviously have a housing issue. So happy to help out any way that I can. And I was about to chat this, this is totally off topic, but when, if you ever need anything, my specialty in law school many years ago was Indi federal Indian law, which you can imagine has absolutely zero use in the estate and tax planning business that I do. But well, that is great to know. I if you ever <laughs> need any help, you could just. I, I've got a big fat book about Indian federal policy right now on my bookshelf. So that's if you great. If you need anything, just let me know. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, um, Municipal Housing Affording Trust Subcommittee has a next step there. Are we good? Can we agree that we're going to end the meeting? Motion Gordon? to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Bye, everybody. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.